Hello and welcome to Chairside Live. I'm your host, Megan Strong. Thanks for joining us today. First up, flashback time. We're re-releasing an exciting Obsidian Pressed Metal case. Then, we're wrapping up Dr. Neil Park's interview with dental practice management consultant, Dr. David Schwab. But first, we've got an Obsidian Pressed Metal case on number seven and number 10, and a screw retained Obsidian Pressed Metal bridge on number eight and nine. Let's go meet up with Dr. Bai and check out this case that's worth revisiting. Welcome back to the Chairside Case of the Week. My name is Dr. Abai and I want to share a very special case with you. This patient came to our clinical operatory here at Glidewell with an existing fixed dental prosthesis spanning from teeth number 7 and 10 and she requested that this bridge be replaced, uh, first of all for aesthetic reasons, but also because there were some open margins uh, around this uh, restoration. So going through with uh, guided surgery, usually for a site like this in the maxillary anterior, uh, I want those implants in place for about three to four months before I go back and remove the temporary and start with the uh, final impression phase. Now, as the patient returns, uh, after a few months, I can go ahead and remove these temporaries and take a look at the soft tissue and evaluate and make sure that my soft tissue is where I want it to be. If I don't have proper contours, uh, this is the stage where I can utilize my temporary and create the contours that I need for uh, my final restorations. And uh, obviously the, the gingival contour is going to be really important uh, for the final aesthetic result. So once we have the temporaries in the proper position and I know that I have proper contours, I'll go ahead and take a final impression. So this was about uh, four months after the implants were replaced. I'll bring the patient back. And I have already created a certain level of gingival architecture. There are different techniques on keeping uh, the architecture while you take a final impression. I didn't think that was necessary in this situation because the patient has a very thick gingival biotype and I can actually go directly to uh, the fabrication of the final restorations. Now one of the restorations that I've found where if a patient uh, and a clinician would prefer a porcelain fused to metal type of restoration, uh, the obsidian to metal has been extremely aesthetic and I found it to be very acceptable in terms of uh, the final results. And uh, in this case, that's exactly what I prescribe for my patient is uh, obsidian to metal restorations uh, for both the uh, implant restorations and the, the lateral which were uh, on natural teeth. So after a, a, a try-in stage, I'll go ahead and deliver the centrals uh, where the uh, screw retained implants. And again, I'll place Teflon and composite. And once those are delivered, I'll go ahead and deliver the both laterals. And um, the best part about utilizing a, a PFM type of restoration is I can go ahead and cement these restorations as I would traditionally cement um, any PFM restoration. So I'll take the patient through uh, the cement cleanup, make sure that I didn't leave any cement behind, and we check the occlusion and we make sure again that on the uh, implant, especially on the implant restorations, the shim stock is passing through. I can see here that the shim stock is catching on the centrals, so I want to make sure I check with articulating paper. And if there are any contacts, I'll go ahead and make my adjustments. And again, I'll polish the porcelain, and then we have a finished product. So I'll take the patient through the entire protocol of making sure that not only do these fit and look nice, but also functionally, and in terms of the occlusion, uh, the patient is comfortable, and, and I can be comfortable uh, with the occlusion. So here you see the final result of the uh, obsidian to metal restorations. They are beautiful and they blend uh, very well together along with the, uh, with the soft tissue and the gingiva. And we were able to really create some nice uh, aesthetics for this patient with the peaks of soft tissue and also with the uh, overlying porcelain on top of these restorations with the obsidian to metal crowns. Well, I hope you enjoyed this case of the week and I hope to see you back here for uh, yet another case of the week here at Glidewell Dental Laboratories. Thank you for that, Dr. Bai. Now, let's turn it over to Dr. Park for the third and final installment of his interview with Dr. David Schwab. They're discussing how to use social media and commercial ads to generate new patients. 
But that's not all. They're even talking about training your staff on how to handle incoming calls from those potential patients. Let's listen in. So David, how are the high tech tools like digital imaging, how, how are they helping dentists in marketing dental implants? Well, the high tech tools all come down to figuring out how to prioritize them. And number one is the website. The website has to be at the center, the hub of the marketing activities. Now, I don't create websites myself, that's a whole other business, but I refer people and they need to get a good website created. But then the next question is content. It's been said that content is king and people say, well, I've got social media, I've got Facebook, what do I do with all this stuff? And all of the web people say to the doctors, you have to give us content. And then they say, well, well where do I get the content from? Now, there are services out there that will write little, what I call generic blogs. And they will say things like, um, you should brush your teeth and you should floss your teeth and so forth. Well, the problem is, that's the same information on every dental blog in the world. It's good information, but how does it distinguish that particular doctor? So what I started doing is a blog creation service. I sort of cracked the code and figured out how to make it time efficient where I do my homework and then by interviewing the doctor, I get all the information and then I create a year's worth of blogs. And then they can put them on their website once a week, which is fabulous. And they can also be linked to all the social media such as Facebook and Twitter and everything else. So I think one of the things that I can help them with digitally is they sometimes get lost with it because they've got full-time jobs. They're trying to run a dental practice. They say, look, you've got the website or we can help you get a website. Uh, we can get this blog taken care of. It doesn't have to be mysterious. It doesn't have to be something that we put something up in January and then we forget about it until July. We can put a year's worth of content in the bank, so to speak, and you just make your withdrawals on a weekly <laughs> basis and it goes up and Google loves it because your SEO goes up and the patients get uh, interested in seeing this on a regular basis and then it goes through and it feeds Facebook and everything else. So it's sort of an elegant system and I think it works great and the doctors enjoy it and I enjoy it because when I pull all that information together to write it up for the doctors, it's fun for me. So David, is it possible to generate new dental implant patients through television advertising and the internet? It absolutely is, Neil. Although I'll tell you, when, when doctors ask me, should I go on TV and on radio? I always say, well, let's do a little reality check. First of all, it requires a lot of intestinal fortitude and it requires a certain budget. If anybody says, I'll devote $500 a month and I'd like to go on radio or TV, it's not going to work. They have to have a realistic budget. Again, I don't actually do this, but I can send people to the right places. And if somebody has a realistic budget, then it can work out. Now, someone says, well, why should I spend thousands of dollars a month to go on television. It sounds like so much money. And I say, well, you have to ask others who have done it what the return on investment is. If somebody is spending $3,000 a month, I'm just using that as an example. I'm not for a moment suggesting that's a budget. But if someone says, I'm spending $3,000 a month, but I'm making $5,000 after variable overhead is subtracted, that's a, they say, well, it should be two times or three times or four times or five times. No, it shouldn't. It should be a profit. So if you spent $3,000, you made $5,000 after variable overhead. And look, if this was a regular investment, forget about dentistry or television or radio, and I said every time you spend $3,000, you can make $5,000, your question to me is why can't I spend $6,000? Why can't, why can't I spend more, not less? So that's kind of the way it goes. So I tell people that they've got to find a good provider, and yes, it can be done, but they have to be in for the long haul, and they have to be prepared. It doesn't necessarily work overnight. But here's the thing about radio, TV, internet advertising that I tell people that's the most important important. The kinds of patients you get are not going to be the kinds of patients you're used to. The patients you're used to, if you're a specialist or referred by a dentist, they're ready to go. If you're a general dentist, they may be referred by a patient's friend or family. They may be really good patients. Or they may be a patient of record who hasn't needed anything for three years and now they need a crown and they will accept the doctor's recommendation. But when you start going to the public at large, Yes, you can, you can target, you can look at demographics, this zip code is that, that zip code, and you can try to find just the right people. But when you're going on mass media, and that's what TV, radio, and internet are, no matter how you try to target it down, you're going to get a wide variety. Some people are, have a high dental IQ because they've done their homework and researched it. Others don't. It's just going to be a little bit of everybody. But here's the common denominator. All these patients take time. When they contact the office, when that phone rings or that email comes in, I tell the doctors, your advertising has done its job. When that patient contacts you, thank your advertiser. They have done a great job. Now it's all up to you. And if you think that this is an animal just like the normal patient and you can just bring them in, talk to them, and it's, it's going to take a tremendous amount more time, tremendous amount more education. And some of them are never going to be good patients. 
That's just sort of, if I can put it in these business terms, that's sort of the sales model. You know, you make sales calls, not everybody is going to convert. But if you have patients and you realize that you need to take time with these patients, then some of them can become absolutely fabulous patients. And there are doctors who will tell you that they're using uh, television, radio, and smart internet marketing, and their return on investment is very, very good for them. So David, what do you think is the weakest link in the education process in dental implant practices? It's interesting because I'm a big fan of staff and I say that they're sometimes just the best people who do the best job. We've got some really talented people working in dentistry, Neil, but think about this for a second. Think about levels of education specific to dentistry. The dentist, tremendous education. Hygienist, assistants, usually formal education in their field. But the people who work in the front, frequently whatever formal education they've had is usually not in the dental profession. So there's a lot of on-the-job training. So I say we've got really smart and good people, but let's train them and sometimes the weakest link is the one that hasn't been trained the one that hasn't been trained and let me give you a really good example and this has come home to me because I've had a chance to listen to phone calls coming into some very sophisticated practices patient calls the office and says I'm interested maybe they, they found the practice on the internet but they've got questions and they talk for a few minutes, sometimes three minutes, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. That's a long time for somebody at the front desk to be on the phone with a potential patient. And then the patient says, oh, you know, I'm not interested. And they hang up, or I'll call you back, or I'll think about it. Or the cell phone connection is broken. But here's what happens. We don't have their name, we don't have their phone number, we don't have a way to follow up. I think what we need to do is, when somebody calls on the phone and they're asking questions and they're a potential patient, to teach the person who's the phone answerer to ask this question. In case we get disconnected, may I please have your name and phone number? Major companies do this all the time, many small businesses do this, and Neil, 95% of the patients will gladly give their name and phone number. If they don't, that's fine, but most do. And then if we, sometimes we do have situations where the cell phone goes out, and guess what, they don't call back, or we have situations where they say, well, I'll think about it and I'll call you back. Now, we need to follow up with those people. A few days later, call them up and say, we had a very nice conversation the other day, and just say, I'm here to help. What additional questions can I answer for you? How can I help you? We won't get all of those people on the phone. We certainly won't get all of those people in the office. But I'm telling you, it's the secret statistic that is hurting implant practices. The secret statistic is the number of people who call each month about to make an appointment but don't follow through. Ask any doctor how many new patients you get per month, they know. Ask them how many patients call and don't end up making an appointment, they don't know. So first track that statistic and then realize that it might be one or two patients a month, it might be several patients a year, but some of those patients are actually big cases and some of those patients really need help. Because if somebody calls a dental office, what they're really doing is they're raising their hand and they're saying, I need help, can you please help me? They may not be ready at that moment to make an appointment, they may not be ready to engage, but they liked what they heard on the phone, people were pleasant, and then a few days later, politely and courteously, somebody calls to follow up, the dialogue continues, and we end up getting the patient in. So I think that really can, can help patients a lot. I just did a podcast on this and had a really, really good response because it's something that people don't think about and it's fairly easy to implement and it just becomes part of our scripting, part of our protocol, part of what we do in the office so that we're not missing these patients who call and we possibly could convert to being new patients. That's a great point. So David, what are the most effective messages that dentists can use in marketing dental implants? First of all, we have to have our list of the benefits of dental implants handy and we have to have them memorized and top of mind so we can just say these very naturally to patients. But beyond that, we have to instill confidence in the patient. And the staff can do that, the doctor can do that, and the message, if I could just play the role of the staff for a minute, because sometimes it's hard for the doctor to blow his or her own horn, is to say, you know, Dr. Smile is an expert. Dr. Smile has done thousands of implants. And we've got so many patients who are really happy. And our goal here for you is to do it once and do it right. And I can tell you that here in our office, we have patients who come to us who have had implants done somewhere else. And the procedure didn't go well. And Dr. Smile has to redo what somebody else has done and make it right. But at the end of the day, you're gonna get a fabulous result because he or she is absolutely professional and dedicated uh, and really is an expert in the field 
and can do a great job for you. Now that passion that I'm saying this with, that I really feel confident in the doctor, I know there are so many staff people who feel that way and they will go on and on if you really get them going about the doctor. But so often in a practice, people fall into patterns, they just fall into, oh, the doctor has a lot of experience, oh, we've done a lot of these, and it just sort of sounds like they're, it, they look like they're waiting for a bus. Instead of saying, you know, we say this with great passion and conviction, because I tell the, the staff people all the time, when you're talking about implants, it may be the 10,000th time you've said some of these things, but to the patient, it's the first time they've heard it. So you have to say something for the 10,000th time as though it was the first time with the same passion, the same energy, and get people to understand that, yeah, you're lucky to be in this office. As a matter of fact, as an aside, I've had patients uh, say to staff, well, I don't know if I can come because, you know, it's 20 minutes away, it's 40 minutes away, I've got to go over the bridge, over the river, over, over the county line or whatever, and I don't know if I really want to do this. And the staff says, you know, you're lucky. We have patients who come in from a lot farther. We have patients who fly in sometimes. We have patients who come in from out of state. So if you're able to come in and get this implant treatment done, and this is going to be, it should be, a once in a lifetime experience for you. So if you can come in, you're lucky to be in the best place with the best doctor. Now, we've sometimes had patients who say to the staff, well, wait a minute, you're just saying that because you work here. And I always tell the staff, you have to have a comeback for that. And the comeback is, yes, I work here. I could work someplace else, but I choose to work here because I want to work for the best. And when, that, when the patients hear that, they think, this is somebody who's been in this business for a while, they know what they're talking about, you know, these people are confident, they know what they're doing, and they're, they're walking the talk. They act very professional, and they're doing a good job, so I feel comfortable and I'm willing to go to the next step. And we all know that the irony is that when the patient finishes the treatment, they go back and they say, this was the best thing I ever did, or I wish I'd done it sooner. As a matter of fact, the most, the most common response from patients after dental implant treatment is, other than it's wonderful and it's great and thank you very much, is, I wish I'd done it sooner. Those are great messages, David. You know, patients sometimes say that dental implant treatment is too expensive. How do you advise practices to respond to that? I think they have to meet the question head on. I mean, it's either too expensive or it's not covered by my insurance or words like that or questions like that. As a matter of fact, on the insurance question, the verbal skill that I like to use is to say that in our practice, we base treat treatment recommendations on the needs of the patient, not the limitations of the benefits, because obviously you can't restrict a diagnosis to just what's covered by insurance. The dentist has an obligation to do a complete diagnosis and inform the patient the patient has to make a decision. But it's not covered by my insurance. No, because insurance is limited. It's designed for some very specific and, and targeted situations in, in dentistry. And what you have is beyond the scope of dental benefits. But even then, well, it's expensive. Well, it's a great value for the dollar, and you're going to get a long-term benefit out of this. And I tell doctors, if, if the patient says, I'm, I really want to do it, I, and it's not, I actually can afford to do it, but I'm still sort of thinking, my gosh, that's a lot of money to spend, I tell the doctors, look, just look the patient in the eye and tell them, you know, I have to tell you honestly, it has happened, it doesn't happen often, but it has happened that we've lost patients because of fees. We have, but we have never lost a patient because of quality. So if you want high quality, if you want it done one, once and done right, uh, we'd love to help you. And I will tell you that the, the imp dental implants are replacement body parts. And if you were shopping for replacement car parts, maybe you'd try to find a discount somewhere and you wouldn't mind if you had to replace it in a few years. But here we're using the best quality materials. We're using the best technology that we've got that exists and it changes a lot and we keep up with it and our job is to give you a great result. So that's what we're offering you and we only know how to do it one way, which is the right way. David, that's a great response. Uh, you know, I, I know you're very busy with uh, seminars, webinars and consulting. What other projects do you have going? Neil, there's many projects going. You know, I still love to do the live presentations. That's really important. That's, that's really my favorite thing to do. And it, it divides into large groups, small groups, workshops. I sometimes say wherever two or more dentists are gathered, I'll be there. But if it's a large group, that's fine too. And yes, I do the webinars. But I started doing podcasts because I think that's a lot of fun too. Because people say, you know, most dentists have a desk that's just piled up with stuff. They've got stacks of stuff. They've got journal articles. It's hard to get to all this stuff. It's not that the stuff isn't important. It's just that they're so darn busy 
busy because they do have businesses to run and patients to treat. So sometimes uh, it helps them because I do a podcast and my podcasts are short. I mean, I've seen people and I've done some myself that are much longer, but I try to keep it to less than 10 minutes so that people can kind of get the point and move on. So I do a podcast and I, I find that uh, doctors listen in their car, they play it at a staff meeting, which is a great use of time, or they when they go to the gym or whatever, but they're, they're able to listen in between patients or get the information. And then what I do is it's published as part of my blog and on my blog I put key points that were in there and if there are any links that people need to go to for more information we do it that way so so all we try to use all the digital media in every way we can and uh, YouTube videos uh, and the new one is the podcast and uh, it's just working out great and it's a lot of fun David so much great information and I know you have even more information available on your website davidschwab.com and I thank you for spending some time with us today Neil, it's always a personal and professional pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Park and Dr. Schwab, for that informative discussion. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Chairside Live. On behalf of everyone here at Glidewell Laboratories, thank you for watching, and I'll meet you right back here next time.